Yeah, Valerie will be joining us uh, shortly. We've got all kinds of fun lined up tonight. We have um, a review of last week's column topic, which was paw paws. And um, let's see, we're going to look at a uh, fairly recent insect invader that um, is a little bit concerning, but we're going to give you some tips what to look for, and um, also some means of control, both natural and um, a little more heavy handed if we need to go that route. Uh, we've got some snakes we're gonna try to identify. And then yes, we're going to have as our grand finale for tonight, um, a visit with Valerie Lane. Um, Full screen. Stories yeah. about what she found when she went to go. visit the um, uh, Brood 10 uh, cicada, uh, emergence that's happening downstate right now. So uh, with all of that said, um, we're going to go ahead and get our uh, screen share for tonight started. Um, and just as a reminder, I see Bob, you're on it already. Uh, if you are um, a part of our King County Certified Naturalist Group and you'd like to use this as part of your uh, continuing education credit, just go ahead and make a little comment at some point and um, we'll save all those and we'll make sure that uh, those, <laughs> we didn't sit through this for nothing. <laughs> so with that, um, let's go ahead and uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, so um, here we are, way down yonder in the Paw Paw Patch. Um, I believe it was last week's uh, second within last week's uh, program where we talked about the Richard Young Forest Preserve in uh, Yorkville and how it had a pawpaw patch in it. Well, it was such a fascinating plant that I thought it deserved a little more than just a mention and a slide. So I want to write a column about it. Um, this is how the uh, blooms appeared to me when I first came upon the plant. Um, they, you can see they kind of face downward. They've got kind of a bell shape to them. Um, and uh, a color, uh, the color actually reminded me a lot of the bloom on a wild ginger plant, which is another plant with a, um, a plant that's got some non-traditional pollinators, as does uh, the pawpaw. I actually had to take the uh, take a hold of the branch and turn it sideways to see the whole uh, part of the, uh, all the parts of the plant, the male and the uh, female reproductive parts, which um, having both um, uh, pistils and stamens uh, on the same plant, I, um, this is known as a perfect flower. Um, but it, it is, um, the process of getting pollinated is anything but perfect. Uh, to avoid um, self-pollination, to, to encourage diversity, um, as the, uh, the male parts of the plant start to release their pollen, the female um, parts of that blossom become um, unreceptive. So uh, you really need to uh, have the help of some insect pollinators. Now this plant, uh, I might have mentioned this when we talked about it before. It doesn't really have a strong odor, and if you if you really sniff at it, the odor you detect isn't terribly pleasant, which is a big clue as to uh, the sort of pollinators that it relies on. Um, the uh, the literature I was reading about pawpaws called uh, the beetles and the flies that pollinate this plant unenthusiastic and unreliable. Um, here we've got a, a flower beetle up there on the left and a uh, housefly there on the right. Um, and they are drawn to uh, the aroma or should we say odor that these plants put out. Um, and they just got to kind of hope for the best. Now, um, I did some reading about commercial production of pawpaws. And, and you, if you think back to, um, you know, the, the last uh, produce department you were in, there probably was not a big pawpaw display. This is a plant that's uh, somewhat difficult to uh, propagate, or actually it, it grows fairly, but 
but it's it's hard to get it to bear fruit because of that um, difficulty in pollination. And um, a lot of growers will uh, hand pollinate. They'll take a little paintbrush and they'll take the, the pollen grains and they'll move them from flower to flower. Uh, although there are some, I, I saw some pictures online, you can look them up as well, where they will actually hang stinky things from their pawpaw trees, dead fish and the like, so that they encourage these unenthusiastic pollinators to at least get in the general vicinity. And then maybe once they're done with the dead fish, they can move over to the, uh, the pawpaw and get the job done. So here's a look at the leaves of this plant. Um, it is an understory uh, shrub or small tree. So it's got some broad leaves that um, uh, do as best they can to, uh, to soak up the sun. Um, if everything goes right with pollination, then as we move into summertime, a fruit starts to form. That fruit gets it um, continues to grow. It gets to be about the size of a mango. Um, here's a, a picture of one um, being held in a hand. Um, when you slice it open, uh, you see that it's a it's a when it's a ripe. When the papa is ripe, it's got a very soft fruit. It's a really sweet fruit. I had the opportunity to taste one uh, when I was down in Kentucky a couple of years ago. And um, it's kind of, a, I don't know, custardy, sort of reminiscent of a banana flavor. Uh, and then it's got those large seeds in the middle. Um, here's another photo. This is a, a glamor shot I found showing uh, both the fruit and the seeds. And as I was looking at this uh, picture, I thought, oh, you know what? I have a glamour shot of my own. I, and, uh, to be perfectly honest, when I took the photo, I didn't even realize that it was pawpaw seeds. It was my friend, Miss Bonnie, who I think is tuned in tonight that uh, helped identify those as pawpaw seeds. But it was, um, here they are. Uh, this was a, a scat I found out in DeKalb County. This was in, uh, I believe it was the first week of December. As before we had much snow, and I was out uh, tromping around, um, not too far from uh, Maple Park, but in the DeKalb uh, County um, part of Maple Park, um, and um, there's a scat with some very large seeds. Here's another view of it. Uh, I took some of those seeds home, uh, put them. Uh, in the, I uh, wrapped them up in, in damp paper towels, put them in the refrigerator. Uh, I've now planted them in my backyard. Of course, we haven't had any rain since then, so I've been trying to remember to go out and water them. I don't know if they will germinate or not, but I'm, I'm hopeful they will. And if they do, I will uh, certainly keep you posted on the progress. I also have an offer uh, from a couple of uh, coworkers here at the Park District in our uh, restoration kill, uh, crew, Jill Votel, and then uh, a former employee, uh, Dave Merrick, have both said that they would give me cuttings from pawpaws that they uh, have grown. Apparently, it's it's fairly easy to propagate from cuttings, um, but uh, won't know for sure how easy that is till I try it. So, um, should that uh, come to fruition uh, sometime in the future, I will certainly keep you uh, let you know about that. So now, um, you know, uh, living here in a river town, we are certainly gifted with a uh, abundance of insects coming up from the river from time to time. I've heard various um, uh, descriptors used before the word river bugs. I think darn river bugs would be a nice family friendly way that some people refer to them. I actually, um, I just came uh, from, uh, getting some video footage over at Pottawatomie Park and uh, some of our board members were commenting on river bugs too. And I, I had to remind them that um, river bugs, um, be they caddisflies or mayflies, um, they are, they're, they're coming from the river. And if they weren't coming from the river, that would be a really bad sign for all of us because um, they need uh, somewhat clean water and uh, they need you know, somewhat well oxygenated water in order to survive. And if the water isn't clean, if it doesn't have oxygen, we're all in big trouble. Let's take a look at these insects. Um, that little group that was flying around there, those are uh, were caddisflies. And caddisflies are by far our most common river bug uh, that we see along the Fox River. Um, and notice I just put the order down, Trichoptera, um, 
to take it down to family or genus or species, that's a little bit um, beyond my skill levels most of the time. Um, but we, we do have actually several different uh, families of caddisflies represented in the Fox River watershed. Um, that name Trichoptera means hairy wings. And um, you might recall that um, the name Lepidoptera means scaly wings. Lepidoptera are, are moths and are butterflies. Um, they have little scales on their wings. Maybe if you've picked one up, you've noticed you get little bits of dust on your hand. Well, um, instead of scales, um, caddisflies have little hairs on their wings. They do look very moth-like. And in fact, they are sort of an aquatic version of a moth. Um, the larvae, which look like this, uh, are kind of caterpillar-like, but uh, they don't live on land, they live in water. Uh, this was a rock I pulled out of Fearson Creek. Um, oh gosh, I forget when this was, within the last year or so. And see this little structure here with all these little uh, bits of uh, grand and gravel and sand kind of glued together. That's a caddis fly house. Um, that's one of many means that these uh, insects will employ to try and keep themselves from getting eaten because just like our caterpillars on land, the caddis flies in the water are food for a lot of different uh, other organisms, whether it's, it's insects or fish, um, uh, all kinds of things that are prowling along uh, down there on the bottom of the stream find caddis flies really tasty. So um, they have this habit of, um, uh, they, they, they live underwater for, I would say about a year's time and then uh, they pupate because this is a, a larva. Uh, so it has to go through that uh, stage of pupation where it just really kind of changes everything um, and comes out as uh, an, a flying. Um, here's some more. Yeah, this is the first this time. Is, really uh, oh, I believe this was uh, Susie when you and I were over at the uh, pedestrian bridge here in St. Charles. So these things sometimes they'll coat, um, you know, a railing. Sometimes they'll coat uh, a windshield. Uh, sometimes I remember one time walking over that bridge several years ago, um, where I actually had to, to make a concerted effort not to get these bugs in my mouth. Uh, so they can come up um, when they when they do uh, emerge from the water. Some, sometimes it's referred to as a hatch, um, but they've actually they they hatch from eggs long ago, and this is really their last and final hurrah uh, as adults. They don't live very long in this stage. The vast majority of their life, as it is with so many insects, is spent in that uh, that larval or immature stage. So they they come out, they find a mate, they lay some eggs, and then they're gone. And then that cycle starts all over again. Um, we also see um, a, a, sort of a similar thing happening with another insect uh, called a mayfly. Now here in the, the Tri-Cities, we don't have really huge uh, populations of mayflies, but um, down a little bit farther south, down south of Yorkville, uh, the Fox River does produce some pretty good uh, mayfly emergences. Um, they uh, have a slightly different look. Uh, I took this photo of a mayfly um, right outside of Good Natured World Headquarters here uh, last summer. I, I don't, again, I'm, I'm not going to even try to go down to family or genus or species, although um, maybe with some effort we could come up with it, but uh, this is one of, of several different types of mayflies that live in the Fox River watershed. Now, mayflies are kind of cool because they, they go through a stage that other insects don't. Now, a, a mature, a, a, an adult insect is sometimes called an imago. And mayflies, they have their immature or nymph phase, and then they go through this phase called a sub-imago, where they shed their skin uh, as they're coming out of the water, but they're not quite ready to fly yet. They shed one more time after that uh, between the, the, um, uh, their stage in the water and when they're flying around. They have this sub-imago stage. Um, this, as you're looking at these, you might think, well, gee, this looks like something my uncle or my grandpa or my dad used to tie when he would go fly fishing. Mayflies are one of the uh, most commonly imitated flies that are used by fly fishermen. There's those that will tie flies that look like caddis flies too, but uh, these mayflies, they've got those, those uh, attractive 
uh, little circe or tails uh, poking off of uh, their the tip of their abdomen. They've got those delicate looking wings. Uh, they're really an attractive bunch of insects to uh, many different types of fish. Now, speaking of attractive, here are some um, mayfly nymphs that we dug out of um, uh, the stream bed over here at Fearson Creek at Fearson Creek Park. These are burrowing mayfly nymphs. Um, we were to, able to get these down to Hexagenia as a genus. Um, they've got these big kind of tusks here at the front. These frilly things on the abdomen are gills. And then, um, I love it when this comes together. We found these uh, in uh, early summertime. And then later summertime, look what comes out of the water. This is what that uh, insect that's spent about a year uh, living and uh, breathing oxygen from the water in you know, the, the semi-clean water, this is what emerges the hexagenia adult. So um, kind of a cool thing. And um, if we don't have the bugs, that means we're all in trouble because it, our water is not producing the way it should. It's, it's not clean enough for their taste. It's, they can't survive. So river bugs, I think they're a good thing. I hope you do too. Now, um, for this next segment, <laughs> Yeah, that's almost exactly the sound I made when these pictures got texted to me. I couldn't. Oh, no, stop, stop, stop. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that twice. <laughs> I should have told you to turn your, your volume down. Um, ah! <laughs> this is the work of the viburnum leaf beetle. And they um, are a... Uh, they're an introduced species and they are doing a real number on um, some of our viburnums in some of our natural areas. These pictures were sent to me by uh, an, a resident of Elgin and these are the woods that are near Sherman Hospital. Uh, this shrub here on the left is almost uh, completely defoliated. Um, here's a, a, a closer look at what leaves, what's become of the leaves. Um, here, um, are the, uh, the broken open eggs of the viburnum leaf beetle uh, along the undersides of the twigs of the uh, shrubs. And then here's the larva um, itself, Peralta viburnae um, is the uh, insect that's doing this. Um, this is what it looks like in a slightly uh, younger phase, uh, stage, life stage. Um, and here's the fact sheet that uh, the USDA has put out. Um, there's a phone number down there at the bottom. You can see uh, if uh, you happen to notice that uh, the viburnum in your yard or if you're out in a park and you happen to see damage, uh, you can uh, call down state and let them know that you're seeing. Um, and uh, this is, it's a helpful fact sheet for identification. It wasn't so helpful in um, telling you what to do once uh, you find it. So um, I actually found a fact sheet here from um, the U, uh, University of Wisconsin uh, extension folks who uh, counsel you to avoid planting certain types of viburnum, specifically arrowwood. Uh, European uh, cranberry and American uh, cranberry bush. Um, and uh, because the, the beetle has a strong preference for those varieties. Um, they also say that you could go, if you've got these, these uh, shrubs in your yard or you know, if you see them in a park, you can, um, starting in say middle of the fall in October, uh, you you can start looking on the twigs for those uh, egg masses like we saw. They, they lay uh, single eggs spread out along uh, the stem of the plant. Uh, you can snip those off and destroy those twigs to help the beetles numbers. Um, you can also encourage natural predators uh, like ladybugs, uh, assassin bugs, lacewings. Um, those too can help uh, reduce uh, 
the Beatles numbers without adding uh, chemicals uh, into the system. There, there was one website I was reading and it said, get a broad spe spectrum insecticide uh, because that'll, you know, that'll kill them. But yeah, it'll kill a lot of other things too. So, you know, if you can encourage these natural predators, that's great. Um, but there's also some other um, measures using horticultural oils um, to coat the eggs. That's going to reduce the number that'll be able to hatch. And then, um, there's these contact insecticides that are listed here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not a, a pest removal person. I'm, I'm, I'm just relaying what uh, Wisconsin Extension is recommending, but um, certainly if you have found these beetles, uh, you definitely want to do your homework before you do anything more than uh, manually remove the, uh, the beetles. Uh, make sure that you're going to um, not uh, be compounding the problem by killing other things too. So let's, uh, let's move on to something a little more fun for a few minutes. Um, uh, we've got a couple of uh, snake species in this area. And I don't know if it's the dry weather or the early warmth that we had, but I've been getting a lot of uh, phone calls and texts from people uh, about snakes um, that they don't recognize. Uh, now, around here, I would say one of our common snakes is the, the garter snake. And uh, garter snakes, of course, they've got that, that prominent yellow uh, or orangish stripe down the middle of their back, uh, the dorsal surface, the top surface of them. Um, and when people see snakes with splotches, they get a little bit nervous. Now, um, what I've pictured here are the, the two snakes that I've been getting the most questions about recently. Um, and these are actually two of Hickory Knoll's education animals. Um, one is actually our on the left here, that is our dearly departed uh, Eastern fox snake, Frankie. Um, I swear that snake had to be over 20 years old. We um, were given Frankie from the, uh, the folks over at the Bartlett Nature Center as a mature fox snake um, over 10 years ago. And Frankie just recently uh, went to that great snake haven in the sky. Um, we stopped using him for programming a few years ago because we could actually feel and hear his bones creaking uh, as the arthritis set into his back. But anyway, um, that's Frank on the left and on the right. We have Mary. She's still going strong. She was actually bred for us by a local reptile breeder. Um, she was neither, uh, she was not uh, taken from the wild. That's not our policy. Um, to, to ever take something from the wild to put it on display. But anyway, putting these two display animals side by side, you might be thinking, my goodness, Pam, there's no way you could get these snakes mixed up. Well, let's take a look at a few wild cousins. Um, here's a couple photos that were sent recently. Um, uh, kind of, you know, Probably not too difficult to see on the left here, we have another fox snake and on the right, we have a milk snake. Um, and what we're looking at here, this pattern, um, the fox snakes pattern has more of a, a blotchy characteristic to it. And the uh, milk snake has a little bit more of a banding characteristic to it. Those, the lighter portions of the markings tend to go down a little bit deeper on the body but it can get even trickier. Um, these photos um, on the uh, left here, this was sent in uh, with the, uh, it said fox snake question mark, but um, the bands here are quite um, obvious. Uh, well, I wouldn't say quite obvious. I looked at this picture for a long time before. In fact, I sent it to two uh, her friends too, to get their opinions on it. But we decided that yes, indeed, this is a milk snake here on the left. And this is a milk snake here on the right. See how there's, the, there's a blotch, but then the light color in between is, uh, has a banding characteristic to it. Now, um, this is a video I got yesterday and, um, I will warn you ahead of time, there is a little bit of strong language. I've tried to um, pull the volume down on this, but um, and I, I might do that again. This, uh, this was a video taken last weekend on the uh, bike trail uh, up by South Elgin. Uh-oh, let's see, where'd our video go? There we go. Hold on. 
right, so sure uh, you recording. can see oh, there's uh, individuals um, on the bike trail and what did they come across? Rise. Let me turn this down a little bit Going. because there is a couple of bad words that come out as the Freaking snake starts to move. Snake. Um, yeah, let's see. But here um, we can see that there's there's a little bit of excitement on the part of the you camera mean, holder. I'm not, and, I'm not touching um, it. Who is not going to be touching the snake? She makes that abundantly clear a couple of different times. Uh, and there's a big um, snake here. Now, looking at this snake, I know, you can see I that know. it's got a, a, a I know. very definite blotchy okay, Jim, characteristic to it. it. To go. We're not seeing much banding. Well, she's going to bring the camera down the again. Oh, bombs. hold on. There's a big snake over here. Be careful. Be careful. Okay, so um, He's the snake doing it, Jim. literally just wants to uh, maybe soak up a oh few rays God. there on the bike trail and then maybe uh, get out of the way. Uh, I'm going to guess this is a female from the stout characteristic of the body. This is a very uh, in general um, male snakes tend to be a little bit leaner. Female snakes uh, have a heavier uh, body shape to them. She it's may have even snake. been out. You guys, it's a rattlesnake. It's not a rattlesnake. <laughs> but again, this I, I love the way this video just sort of typifies the, the general public's reaction when they see anything see other than a garter it. snake. Um, OK, from there, the, no, the camera zooms around a little bit more. And then the snake oh was happily on its way. And we can assume that our bicyclist friends did too. But um, the blotchy brown. Um, the, the brown blotches on that snake, um, the lack of bands in, in between those blotches, it was just sort of a, a random blotchy effect all the way down the snake. Um, that was a fox snake and it, it was not a rattlesnake. Um, I actually emailed the person who sent me the video who had gotten it from a friend of hers. So everybody's clear, we don't have venomous snakes on our bike trails um, in this part of Illinois. Now, um, so far, I've just been using terms like, you know, blotchy and banding and, and it's just sort of a general, uh, I used to think of it as kind of like a channeling the essence of the animal. Uh, a friend of mine who's a herper used the term gestalt. You just kind of look at the animal and you get a feeling that it's one uh, or the other. Um, there are some actually some concrete traits you can look for. Um, snakes uh, around here, uh, well, snakes any, around anywhere, um, they'll either have keels on their snake on their scales, or they won't. The keel is a, a, a bump, uh, a raised um, a keel <laughs> uh, that goes through the middle of the scale. Smooth snakes have no keels. Um, and they tend to feel uh, kind of slippery. They're not slimy, but they do feel kind of slippery because the keel is this raised surface in the middle of the scale and it, it makes the, feel, the snake feel very uh, rough and very dry. Uh, now, milk snakes, um, their genus name is Lampropeltis, which means shiny scale, and the smooth scales do appear shiny. So that's kind of a, a helpful way to remember that the, uh, the milk snake has no keels on its scales. Now, um, the fox snake, uh, their genus name is Pantherophus, and it means panther snake, which I didn't find that helpful at all in trying to remember that there were keels on these guys. Um, uh, they're also what we would call a weakly keeled um, snake, so not every uh, scale on the snake's back is going to have this raised line in it. Um, be most the keels that they have, they'll be most prominent in the middle of the back, right? And what that dorsal area would be. So um, the other thing you can look for is uh, you can get a hold of the snake and you can um, turn it upside down and you look at the belly scales, which go from one side of the snake to the other. But you get to this part right where the snake's tail starts. And yes, snakes do have tails, but there's this... Um, prominent scale here that kind of overlaps some of the other ones. That's called the anal plate. And that's, uh, that's underneath that plate is where the snake's cloaca or vent is. That's that 
uh, all-purpose shoot, or as I heard one person one time refer to it as the Swiss army knife of orifices. That's where the feces come out. That's where the urates come out. That's where if it's a female and it's an egg layer, the eggs are going to come out of there. It's just a really handy sort of hole to have. But on the fox snake, the anal plate covering up the cloaca is what we call divided or split. And over here, uh, the milk snake has an anal plate that is whole or entire um, or single, it's sometimes referred to. So you can always check for those too, should you be able to flip the snake over. Or you know what, if you're looking at a shed skin, all of these characteristics will be common, uh, commonly seen too. You can look for those keels, you can look for the division or lack of division on the anal plates, even if you're just looking at the shed skin. So hopefully that's some information that you can use. Um, this is another, um, I, I, I'm used to those old um, black and white drawings. I found this um, diagram to share. It's going to take me some getting used to, but maybe uh, you might find it uh, more helpful. It gives the profile view of what this, the keel looks like as it's raised up. Um, with the fox snakes, we're talking about weakly keeled. And with the um, milk snakes, we're talking about um, no keel at all. Um, and then here is our drawings of our single or whole anal plate and then our divided or split anal plate on those two scales. All right, one more tip, how to tell if a snake is dangerous. Are you leaving it alone? Yes, then it's not dangerous. Uh, did it have a chance to escape? If the answer is yes, then it's not dangerous. Uh, are you trying to kill it? grab it or harass it in any way. If you say no, it is still not dangerous. Um, however, if you are doing any of those things, it is going to be dangerous. Um, I thought this was a great way to, to think about snakes. Um, it's uh, your actions that put yourself in danger, uh, not the snakes. Now, this holds true for just about every snake we have around here, except for water snakes. They, you know, they live life on their own terms and they are the only snake I know who will actually sometimes come towards you. But that's another story for another time because uh, we have something really, really important that we need to get to. Um, we are going to, um, first of all, we're gonna set this, the mood here with the music. is around anymore called the significant others and it was recorded at the uh, the uh, 2004 emergence of group 10 that's group x that's the roman numeral 10 group 10 and their last emergence uh, group 10 is actually the largest of the cicada uh, broods that we have in north america and um, this is where we are going to learn from the expert, uh, the one and only Valerie Blaine, who made the trip uh, downstate last, um, last week to see these incredible insects. They're emerging not by the millions and not by the billions, but by the trillions in many parts of the Eastern United States. Valerie, are you here with us today? I'm gonna stop the share here and uh, see if we can pick you out of the crowd. Valerie, are you here? I am, I am here. Can you hear me? I can. Can everybody hear Valerie? Okay. I think so. All right. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, um, I'm thrilled to, that you asked me to come uh, share one of the uh, one of my great interests, and that is insects of all kind, but um, particularly these insects that you've uh, built up such a great uh, intro to. Um, so yeah, I um, one of my favorite places in Illinois, well, probably the most favorite place in Illinois for me is um, 
a preserve called Forest Glen, and it's in Vermilion County in East Central Illinois, and it happens to be in the um, range of Brood X. So I made sure to get down there um, when I heard that Brood X had emerged, and so I'd be happy to share some some photos and stories if you like. Um, do you want to share screen, Pam, or? Yeah, I think, um, let's see, you can go ahead, you can, can, do you get the share when you? Um, uh, oh, I see, got it. Share got screen. It. And let's see, share sound. Oops, I got the St. Charles just right there. Huh. Um, the insidious screen that keeps coming up. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Don't um, know why. <laughs> and while I'm looking for this, um, I wanted to say it's great to uh, see so many of you um, that uh, on, that are following Pam on the Good Natured Hour. So, okay. So, can everybody see this? Yep. Are you are you see, seeing my screen? Okay. Well, that was pretty cool uh, music, Pam, that you played, but um, I am a tried and true Beatle maniac. Um, and I think the best song is, I saw standing there where Paul McCartney sings, well, she was just 17. And uh, <laughs> you know that's what my I mean. <laughs> uh, Right, yes. Now, the granted, Beatles are in a different order altogether than cicadas, but, um, uh, <laughs> That's my that's my uh, my inspiration. So Brew 10 2021. I knew it was coming and I couldn't wait to uh, to experience them. Uh, this is a map of the broods of periodical cicadas in North America. And um, you can see, let me see if my pointer works here. Well, I guess not. Uh, but Brew 10 is the purple. And um, we have a smattering of that purple in East Central Illinois. And Brew 10 has, it comes up in different spots in Indiana and Ohio and big time um, in uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts and, uh, well, I'm sorry, not Massachusetts, but um, uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey and places like that. We've been hearing uh, reports of those. But we have a little bit here in in Illinois. Uh, so this is Vermilion County. If, if just to kind of place uh, put a, a a place there. Um, first of all, I might just step back and and see if people understand the concept of brood. Um, now I don't know, Pam. I can't see questions. But um, or if people can, I can chime keep in. an eye on, on chats for you. Okay. So um, in in the cicada world, a brood is um, a group of periodical cicadas that are timed together. They're synchronized in their emergence, and uh, periodical cicadas can be thirteen or seventeen year broods. But a brood may comprise several different species. And in this case, in brood 10, there are um, three different species. So it, it, it kind of seems confusing because you would think a brood would all be one species, but it, a brood really is just a group that is on the same schedule. Um, when the soil gets to be 64 degrees, um, at six to 10 inches below the surface of the ground. That's the ideal conditions for these guys to start uh, coming up out of the ground. And they're coming up Im as immatures. So they're gonna be burrowing up through the ground and uh, when, when there's an emergence, there are cicada holes all over, at, all over the woods. Um, a little easier to see this one here where it's on a, a trail. Um, so the holes, I don't have a measurement on that, but they're, you know, fairly good size. And from these holes, mostly at night, 
come out the young cicadas. Um, this is a cicada emerging from uh, its protective little exoskeleton. Uh, and this is called the teneral stage. It's, um, uh, Pam, Pam showed one of the, um, when it first emerges, it's really vulnerable at, at that time. It, its uh, wings haven't quite formed yet. This is also when they're most edible. They're most delicious for all kinds of things, including humans. People do, people have uh, eaten lots of cicadas before. Uh, you know, when they come out by the billions, uh, that's a lot of protein there. But anyway, so looking at this guy that's just breaking through um, the, that nymphal stage uh, with its exoskeleton, there's a drop of liquid. And I'm not sure what that is. If anybody knows, uh, put that in the chat. But lots of the emerging cicadas had that drop of, of liquid. What's really awesome is when they really split free, <clears throat> they do this backflip where they come out backwards and they may be just in suspended animation like this for a while because it's a very slow process. Again, their, their bodies are really soft and it takes time for them to harden up. Um, so they, they may be all up and down the tree. You'll see these guys, these whitish insects that are flipping backwards as they're coming out of their um, exoskeleton. Excuse me, um, I, I couldn't resist taking pictures. It was so cool. Check out the tiny little wings there. They're still white and unformed. This dark spot behind the eyes, um, it could be a predator avoidance thing like extra eye spots, although that wouldn't quite make sense because these are pretty darn visible insects. But that pigment, that's, a, that's the pigment that they will eventually have all over their bodies. So on the right, you can see an adult and that's what it's going to look like. It'll, it'll get darker while it hardens. And again, here's one of those, uh, that's a tenoral uh, stage of the cicada coming out and there's that drop of liquid. And I have, I don't know if this will, um, if you'll be able to hear this, um, but if the audio doesn't come up real well, you could check out the legs um, of this little guy as it's uh, coming out of the, uh, of its exoskeleton. So pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and their eyes, periodical cicadas eyes are bright red. Um, it's really hard to hard to miss them and, and hard not to admire them because they're so beautiful. Uh, at the base of the trees, it, there can be hundreds and hundreds of a combination of exoskeletons and these newly emerged um, the cicadas in the tenoral stage and um, the adults that have fallen there and maybe died or um, have just fallen because they're very clumsy flyers. Now I noticed as I was walking around there were some that seemed to have gotten stuck in their exoskeleton and uh, so it looks like this one already its body had hardened and it got that dark coloration um, but it didn't seem to come out of the exoskeleton. Mm. And this is what it looks like at the base of, of uh, a lot of trees, just cicadas everywhere. Um, this, this is a park-like area at Forest Glen, um, you know, outside of the woods, but the trees are just crawling with cicadas. And here's another video. I think there's some, um, I'll try to turn off some here. Once you see the holes, you go, wow, okay, yeah. I understand. Uh, this was a sugar maple that was pretty loaded with them. And they're just hanging out 
there as they're coming out of their exoskeletons? Valerie, um, is asking how long does it take them to mature uh, once they leave that exoskeleton behind? So like basically how long did it take for, to harden up? Um, um, in a, a few hours. In, in a few hours. They are in a really tight schedule because after waiting for 17 years of developing underground, they've got this little window of opportunity to, to, uh, to come up and mature as adults. And the only thing that they exist for then is to find a mate and copulate. And, and then that's it for them. So they, um, they mature pretty quickly once they come out of the, the um, uh, that general stage. Another comment, wow, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, I think you might be onto something, Professor Blaine, with that, uh, that um, concentration of pigment up at the front like that, it really does look like eyes. Yeah, they certainly it's like eye spots. Yeah. Um, and that's when they're still really vulnerable because that skin has not Exactly. That's right. And, you know, they, they barely have in their wings, so they can't, they, they're not very mobile. This, is, this shows a combination of the adults and the little ones crawling up. Let's see. So out in the woods, pretty much everywhere you look, there are cicadas. <laughs> did you, when you were there, did you run into other people who were like reveling in this? Or was there anybody that like ran away screaming or? Um, um, were you the I, only one there? <laughs> I think I was the only one. I was the only cicada tourist um, uh, had gone out of my way to go down there. A naturalist friend of mine there said that uh, somebody in the campground about the bugs. It's like, well, exactly what would you like us to do about these? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, they're just something, something to enjoy, you know, while, while you can. Um, and I had been camping at Forest Glen in 2004, so 17 years ago when uh, the last emergence came out and I was with my son and I have to correct uh, the math I had mentioned to somebody earlier. He was 12, not 10. Um, but um, when we were there, it was pretty warm and sunny. And compared to last week when I was there, other than this photo, which the sun just happened to come out for a second, it was in the 60s and cloudy this past week. Not, not the most inspiring for the cicadas to sing, but by contrast, 17 years ago, when my son and I were there, the, the sun and the heat, the, they, they, the sound was really deafening. We couldn't carry on a conversation because it was so loud. Wow. Um, and uh, I, I know it's been measured in decibels. I don't recall right now what, what uh, some people have come up with in terms of the noise factor. They're very cooperative um, for a camera because they're very slow. They don't, they don't move around much. They just sit there. Um, and they're very clumsy flyers too. So um, now I was looking for, uh, try, I wanted to find a female in the process of laying eggs. Part of, part of this whole um, symphony of the cicada lifestyle is the, um, the males will court the females up in the treetops, belting out their songs uh, to impress the ladies. And when they copulate, the female will then go to lay eggs on a, a twig or a branch. And her ovipositor makes a slit in the branch where she can, she will then um, deposit the eggs. Now, people with nurseries get kind of concerned about this because it can damage the trees, but it's not really not been a problem in a forest. 
uh, and there's no way you could protect all the trees anyway. I, I was, as I said, I was hoping to find a female and, and kind of film that process, but um, this was just, this one was just sitting on the, uh, the twig and wasn't really doing much at that point. Um, ditto here. Um, and this, hopefully you can hear some of this noise. This was at the edge of the prairie and it was getting loud. And check out, you can see them flying around and they're just real, like I said, they're real clutchy. They bash into the branches and then they'll fall down. So my, my husband has tinnitus and he goes, well, this is what it sounds like for me all the time anyway. So. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I collected a bunch of figuring out which species are which. Um, as I mentioned, there are three different species in this brood. So I kind of separated them on my desk here. Um, oh, and cool. um, yeah, they don't, I, I don't really know the common, I don't think they have common names. And so uh, uh, this is basically it. And the septum decula is very, sounds very similar to the septum decula septum decim, so pretty tongue, tongue twisters. That, um, uh, basically, you take and tell them apart by the stripes on their abdomens, and then there's a, a um, the, the one on the right, the septum decim, has a real visible yellow spot between the eye and the wing. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, that, that was my adventure. I hope I can get down there again uh, before they're finished, but the calendar is pretty, pretty packed. Um, so anyway, if anybody has any questions. We, um, we did have some questions come through, Valerie, and I just wanted to, I know we've got some Illini in the, uh, the, the uh, group tonight. Um, Forest Glen is um, not too far from Danville, and Danville is not too far from Champaign-Urbana. Um, how far right. is it? About um, I think it's, oh, could it be 55 miles from Urbana? I used to drive it from Urbana all the time. Um, it's a pretty easy drive. You just go straight east on 74 to Danville, and then you drop down um, 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 oh, I don't remember the road, um, but the, your Google Maps will get get you there. It's the it's gas station. Uh, right, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. Um, but yeah, we did have we've got a couple of questions here. Ted was asking, um, how did the eggs get to the ground? Um, Aha, good question. Um, the the twig. Um, will fall to the ground and the eggs um, develop into uh, very young nymphs that then immediately burrow down into the ground. I guess they get themselves set up with entertainment for 17 years then, and <laughs> then uh, they slowly develop. And all throughout those 17 years, they're uh, sucking on uh, the juices, so to speak, of plant roots. So that's how they get sustenance throughout all that time. Uh, Diane shared uh, that you took great photos. Um, Greg and Kelly said that cicadas um, can be as loud as 100 decibels, which is the same yeah, okay. loudness as a lawnmower. Um, Beth's dogs love to eat them. I, I, you know what, Beth, I had a Cocker Spaniel during um, I was living in Evanston during the 1990 emergence um, of Brood 13, which is what we have up in this area. And we couldn't go anywhere because all she'd do is eat and eat and eat. Um, just loved them. And that 
kind of folds into Marianne's question is, have you ever eaten one? Um, I, I, I have not. Kind of, yeah. um, I haven't had one. I, yeah, there are lots of, um, you can Google cicada recipes or even cookbooks. Um, uh, I actually have a PDF from our list. Uh, there you go. Might have even been, the, no, I don't think we had PDFs in 1990. I think it was 2007. Somebody created a little cookbook. So if anybody wants that, drop me a line and I'd be glad to email you. Um, they have a real distinct smell. I mean, I can smell them better. They're here on my desk. Um, and can you smell them kind of? There's a certain, certain kind of odor. And I don't know if that has to do with how tasty they are or not. Mmm, <laughs> my mouth is water. Yeah. Bob, uh, I mean, anything tastes good when it's fried. <laughs> well, in fact, that's some of the recipes I saw where, you know, like saute them and olive oil and um, yeah, put a little basil on them and whatever. <laughs> yeah. but it, overall, I think it's, um, it's a really fascinating um, direction that evolution has taken. Uh, why it has gone this direction with this crazy, you know, 17 year life cycle, we don't know, but uh, it has worked for them. Um, sadly, well, as we continue to break up soil and put asphalt and concrete over the soil, we're losing lots of awesome insects like this. And who knows how many really cool fungi and, and other kinds of organisms. Uh, clearly these guys can't come up through through asphalt um so it's um really well worth experiencing this if you can you know get to a woods where there is an outbreak and 17 years from now i will be 84 and i'm hoping to still be hiking in the woods uh <laughs> when the next emergence comes out oh they could hold the key to longevity. You never know. You know, they have, they have a few mouthfuls. Um, yeah, maybe if I snack on them or something. Yeah. <laughs> we have, Valerie, we have a couple more uh, comments here. Um, let's see. Um, Bob Brill had heard on NPR that two different broods are scheduled to emerge in 2024, which is very unusual. If they interbred, would there be a different cycle of emergence? You know, um, Bob, we already kind of have something weird going on with our brood uh, in this area, which is due in 2024, brood 13. There's a straggler brood that's four years, um, I don't know if you'd call it four years behind or 13 years ahead, um, but uh, this started back in the 1960s. And um, my mom lives over in Wheaton and she actually had some of those stragglers from uh, brood 13 appear in her yard last year. Um, I've got, um, Valerie, when you were talking about the, um, let's see if I can hold this up here where you guys can see it. Oh, there we go. Um, this, is, um, this is from the little maple tree she has in her front yard in, um, late June or July of last year, I saw there, there were little portions of that maple tree that um, had dead branches and, and not, not a branch. I mean, this is just a little twig, but it's, it's almost like a self pruning or a, a natural pruning that happens. But can you see these lines here? There's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. Those were different ova position sites for the cicada. So she's made a slit, put an egg, made a slit, put an egg, made a slit, put an egg. And that actually killed off this tiny little twig. The tree itself is still doing fine, but um, nobody really knows why they got off cycle the way they did in uh, the 1960s. But, and they've continued on that 17 year span. So I, I don't know if two different groups were to emerge at the same time. I don't know if it would change the timing at all or not. They probably just have to make sure they were finding the right species to be mating with, since there are three different ones that tend to come out at the same time. But um, uh, 
Uh, let's see, I know we had some other comments too. Hold on. Uh, Diane want to know if they're good for fish bait. Uh, we need our Ryan Solomon here to comment on that. I personally, you know, if I didn't feel so bad about eating one that had spent 17 years developing and just kind of, you know, putting that all to a halt because I was hungry, I would, I would eat one. Um, so, you know, maybe some of those ones that are destined to not develop, maybe the wings are crumpled as they're hardening up. You know, maybe I could try one of those under the guise of, you know, kind of a putting it out of its misery sort of meal. <laughs> um, hold on, we had a couple more comments. Um, uh, are these species specific to this brood? That's a good question too, Diane, and, and they're not. Um, but they are specific to the 17-year phenomenon. Um, uh, Cassinii and Septendula and Septendisum, Septendus. You, you, Professor Blaine says it way better than I do, but those three species. Um, but they are, they, the broods are kind of determined by geographic boundaries um, and then the year of their emergence. And I, like I said, I think there's 13 total and we happen to be brood 13, hmm. Northern Illinois. Um, and then there, there's also, there's also there's 17, I'm sorry, 13 year cicadas as well. Southern Illinois has a 13 year brood that I saw in uh, 1998. That was pretty cool to see all the creatures. Um, I know down at uh, Forest Glen, they have box turtles, right? Yes. Um, Imagine good, that's probably really good food for box turtles. <laughs> sure. and, uh, with, there are so many different types of animals that uh, can eat uh, cicadas, the annual cicadas as well as these periodic cicadas. Uh, I saw robins eating them. There is a really noticeable increase in pileated woodpeckers at Forest Glen. Part of that explanation is the emerald ash borer. However, the pileateds were really taking advantage of these big, fat, juicy morsels on the sides of the, of the trees. Um, oh, yeah. And <laughs> raccoons will eat them. Um, uh, you know, turtles, yes, lots of different things can eat them. They yeah. come out in, in such numbers, though, that it's kind of like there's safety in numbers with these huge emergences. They, there's no way that their population could get wiped out by predators if they come out in the millions or billions. It, um, what does do them in, as I said, is our destroying their habitat. <laughs> Kim had asked the question, what do they eat underneath the ground? Um, they're, they feed on plant juices, Kim, and I'm going to try and hold this up I don't know if my camera is going to be good enough for you to see um, the piercing and sucking mouth part that they have. Uh, it's not going to work. This, this is, by the way, this is not a um, periodical cicada. This was an annual cicada that just happened to be laying here on my desk. Um, yeah, yeah, it's too fuzzy. Anyway, they've got it like a, it's, you know how they, like you, you poke a straw in a Capri Sun? Well, their mouth part is a lot like that straw. It's, it's sharp on one end. They, they stick it into a root. Um, they molt, um, I forget how many stages they go through on their way to becoming an adult, but it, they go through successive sheds underneath the ground and they, they might um, you know, plug into a different part of the root as they proceed um, through those different developmental stages, but it's plant juices that they're feeding on. And I think that's another great thing. You know, whenever we see a, a big number of insects like this, we always get worried, you know, oh, you know, it's an infestation. But the fact that there were all these billions of insects feeding on these trees underneath the ground and the trees are all fine, you know, just, you know, shows. And it, then plus when they, when they dig up uh, and emerge, out of the soil, they're providing aeration for those roots too that they've been sucking on. So um, it seems to be a relationship really well. Any, oh, one more question. Well then, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> it was from Sarah. Uh, and thank you, Pam, for inviting me. Um, 
I'm definitely going to tune in weekly now. You're getting me hooked like you've got nobody else hooked. Uh, and it was it was great to be able to to share with the people who may be like minded. There not you everybody know. in the world. Not everybody in the world thinks it's exciting to look at cicadas. <laughs> well, we really appreciate you joining us tonight, Valerie, and and everybody else too. Um, hope you enjoy. Um, the rest of the steamy Tuesday and what looks to be a steamy week. I want to note that we still didn't get the rain that they said we were going to get. So let's all do uh, do our rain dances as best we can to see if we can get some moisture into the ground so that we will have a continuation of cicadas and other insects as well. So with that, um, we've got a little bit over tonight. I hope you're all still awake. And if not, nighty night, um, sleep tight. We'll see y'all back next week. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam and Valerie. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam and Valerie. It was great. Have a good night.